I'm Seth Andrews, and what you're about to hear is a true story. His name sounded like the name of a Midwest town, Lafayette. And Lafayette had a wild imagination, especially about himself. Lafayette was born the 13th of March, 1911, to a military family that moved around a lot. In his youth and throughout his life, he did a lot of creative writing, but he was not a studious person. He ended up getting disenrolled from high school. Lafayette was failing almost every major subject. His mother would eventually finish his high school education from home. Now, Lafayette might have imagined himself a great mind, a great man. Lafayette seemed to imagine himself a great many things. But as you're about to see, circumstances would usually prove otherwise. Lafayette got himself into college. He would one day boast that he had a bachelor's in engineering from George Washington University and a doctorate from Sequoia University, Dr. Lafayette. But in truth, if you look at the records from George Washington U, Lafayette dropped out after 18 months, no degree, and there is no accredited college called Sequoia. Sequoia University was what is commonly referred to as a degree mill. You pay a few bucks and this degree mill will give you the certificate. Lafayette's proclaimed doctorate of philosophy had come from a school that wasn't actually a school. In fact, Sequoia was shut down by court order in 1984. Now, if you're beginning to see a pattern, you are beginning to see Lafayette. He attempted to follow in his father's footsteps into the United States Navy. That proved futile. He failed the entrance exam and suffered from extreme nearsightedness, not military material. But he would eventually find his way into the armed forces with a forged recommendation letter that was written by a Washington buddy on government stationery. Very official-looking stuff. More creative writing and the Navy finally accepted him. He served as a lieutenant in the 1940s, and he was, by all accounts, a second-rate soldier. Constant complaints that he was exaggerating his abilities, his accomplishments, his importance. He kept being relocated because his work was so substandard. He did serve in the Second World War, But his pattern continued. He continued to spin these wild stories about being a battlefield hero. He was a spy for naval intelligence. He was a man of combat. 27 combat medals, including the Bronze Star and the Purple Hearts. But once again, here comes the reality check. Lafayette had gotten only four medals for basic service, not 27. He'd received no special combat training. He never went to officer's training school. He was never a spy, was never a hero. And that purple heart that he boasted of? Injury on the battlefield? Total fiction. Lafayette had ended up in a military hospital, but it was for a stomach ulcer. And yet, time and again, everywhere he went... Lafayette, this real-life Walter Mitty, would boast about all of his many accomplishments. He would claim at one point he was a nuclear physicist. And yet, if you look at the transcript from George Washington University, Lafayette had gotten an F in physics. Now, let's talk about Lafayette, the creative writer. Despite the fact that he had terrible grades in college, he did get published in the college newspaper, and a few of those articles found their way into other literary circles. He would eventually become a -a penny-a-word freelance writer for pulp fiction magazines. If you're wondering what penny-a-word means, you already know what it means. He was paid a set fee, small change, really, And the fee was based on the amount of words or lines that he submitted. In the business, penny-a-word writers are kind of a punchline. The elite, the A and B listers just look down on you. You are 
kind of the lowest common denominator. You're a pretender. You're just a hack. Of course, given his long history of exaggeration, Lafayette probably told his friends he was writing for the big time, perhaps even in line for the Pulitzer. Who really knows? But this was not great literature. This was income, just a few bucks to barely pay the bills. The genres of his stories, sci-fi, fantasy, adventure, fiction, mystery, even some romance. And he pecked away at his typewriter. He saw his stuff in print here and there, and occasionally even got to brush elbows with heavy hitters like the great Isaac Asimov and Harlan Ellison. This was the small fish glancing by the big fish. Okay, here is where Lafayette's story gets really interesting. April 1938. He allegedly underwent a dental procedure. He was at the dentist's office, and they gave him medication for pain, right, the numbing meds, and he had a terrible allergic reaction to the painkillers. And according to him, this trauma had brought about a near-death experience. And in that moment, he had seen beyond. He had transcended this mortal plane, and he had reached into the world of the spiritual. And he was so inspired that he would one day take this professed encounter and translate it into a book. His book was a wild mix of psychology, or supposed psychology, and sci-fi. And he actually submitted this book to the Journal of the American Medical Association and the American Journal of Psychiatry, pitching just crazy stuff, sci-fi sounding claims, wild philosophies about superhumans, psychic powers, phantasms, the reactive mind, coma gnomes, mental masses. Scientific American would one day declare that this book contained, quote, more promises and less evidence per page than any publication since the invention of printing. But Lafayette would not sit with this rejection. He got his book published elsewhere. He started his own foundation in the summer of 1950, and he announced to the general public, hey, I have discovered the source of all human afflictions, and of course, I will happily sell you the cure. Lafayette would go on to give thousands of lectures. 500 supporter groups popped up all around the United States. His book became a bestseller. 100,000 copies sold in two years. And Lafayette the man of wild imagination who had conjured up so many tales and also had become known in the business world as disreputable, a con, an angler, a grifter, a man who could not deliver on his promises, made even more promises for a price. And so many people gladly lined up to pay that price, an expensive price, They would take out loans and max out credit cards and mortgage their houses just to find peace in their hearts. These fantastical claims, the wild, weird, sci-fi sounding book that would eventually go on to become the cornerstone of an entire religion. That book was, of course, Dianetics. And its author, the Penny Award sci-fi writer, who had fictionalized so much of his own life story, Lafayette, was Lafayette Hubbard. Lafayette Ronald Hubbard. L. Ron Hubbard. The founder of the Church of Scientology. And that is a true story. True Stories Podcast dot com.